Welcome to FYI, the four-year innovation podcast. This show offers an intellectual discussion on technologically enabled disruption, because investing in innovation starts with understanding it. To learn more, visit arc-invest.com. Arc Invest is a registered investment advisor focused on investing in disruptive innovation. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. It does not constitute either explicitly or implicitly any provision of services or products by ARC. All statements made regarding companies or securities are strictly beliefs and points of view held by ARC or podcast guests and are not endorsements or recommendations by ARC to buy, sell, or hold any security. Clients of ARC Investment Management may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Welcome to ARC's four-year innovation podcast. Today, we've got a great guest. We've got CEO and founder of Figure AI, Brett Adcock. Brett, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Sam. You know, before we dive into robots changing the world as we know it, maybe we can give people a little bit of your background. You know, we've actually interacted before because you also, you know, started uh, Archer as well. And uh, that's another crazy, exciting business. So it'd be great to learn your past and how you came to be building a robot company now. Yeah, so my background is pretty straightforward. I've been working in on building technology companies for 20 years now. Uh, about half that time has been spent in areas of software and internet, and the last half have been spent in areas of AI and hardware. So my last software company was uh, kind of a machine learning first driven marketplace around the recruiting space uh, called Vettery that I started in 2020, sorry, 2012. Sold that business in 2017 to the world's largest recruiting company called the Deco Group. And then in 2018, I started Archer Aviation. So what we do is build electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. Happy to say Arc is one of our biggest investors and I'm so glad we got to meet like several years back. The goal of uh, why I started Archer was basically just help alleviate traffic and help move to a sustainable form of transportation. So yeah, I worked on about six generation aircraft. We are currently working to certify our aircraft called Midnight, which is a four passenger piloted aircraft with FAA. And we really hope to introduce that into the airspace uh, in the near term here in the US. I left Archer about a year and a half ago to start Figure. So what Figure does is we are looking to deploy autonomous humanoid robots. So a humanoid is um, kind of like a human form. So we have legs and arms and hands. And what we're trying to do is physical work similar to what humans do today. We have a big belief here at Figure that the whole world was built for humans, meaning um, we've kind of built this world around the way we look. So our view is if we had wheels and if we had like six arms and six hands, the world would look a lot different. It's not as if we're trying to optimize for this world. It's actually the opposite. We've actually optimized the physical world to interact with our bodies, different heights that we have, the way we manipulate objects. So we, you know, we sit in chairs, we use, we use machinery, we touch tools, like, and we've, we've made all these items to basically interact with our, the, the form that we have today. So really what we're doing here in a nutshell is we're trying to be able to build a automation system, a autonomous automation system to be able to do human like work. So our robot is about five foot six. It's all electromechanical. And we have an AI first strategy to introduce this into service to do physical labor. That means putting robots into commercial opportunities to help in the warehouses and manufacturing and retail. And over time, I have a strong belief that every human will own a humanoid, uh, much like your car or phone today, where this robot will be able to do anything you, you want it to do physically. So grab me a coffee, do my laundry, do this errand. And um, our team's about 70 engineers today based in California. Uh, we've uh, are now walking our first generation robot and it's now doing complete end to end applications in our lab here. So we're hitting a button and it's doing like real human level work, <laughs> which is pretty, it's pretty crazy. And, uh, we're working to, uh, now to make that much more robust. A lot of it happens to sit in software at this point. So it's basically like, uh, sizing our entire roadmap, I would say for the considerable amount of years forward. And into next year, we actually want to start doing real world applications with our customers actually at their facilities. So hopefully as we approach the end of 2024, we're able to start demonstrating like real humanoid robots that are highly robust 
into real commercial settings doing real work. For us, I guess, as roboticists, it doesn't get any more exciting to wake up to a future, I guess, like that. Yeah, maybe we can dive into the software side, right? So one of the big questions always is, why now? And it seems like computer vision and advancements in AI and you know potentially putting that in a mobile unit like a robot is enabling this. At the same time, you know, I think we've seen you discuss it on Twitter. We've seen Elon discuss it as well, is that you go to start building a robot and all of a sudden you realize, wait, this is also a hardware problem and no one's making the correct actuators here. You can't buy stuff off the shelf that works. And so how does how do those two come together for making this a now we can do this? I get asked this quite a lot. Like why what are you know, and even reflecting on ourselves too, we ask ourselves like this quite a lot. I think there's like three or four things that were just not physically possible, like like from a physics perspective, ten years ago, maybe even a little bit less. The first is um, we need to be able to walk a bipedal humanoid, which means two legs need to be able to balance. It needs to be highly robust to disturbances, so we need to be able to interact with that environment, feel it, understand what's going on, and react to it really quickly. If you look back ten years ago, when you walk, like look at humanoids, like you know, in video clips or online, they were basically comical. They were extremely slow, hard to balance, falling over everywhere. The last best data point we have is around the DARPA Robotics Challenge in 2015. You look at them, you just like it was really hard to draw a parallel to like, okay, that's that that's something I can interact with really closely in a real environment. Uh, if you look at the the best in the world in terms of like bipedal dynamic walking today, whether it's us or Boston Dynamics, the rest, you, you can see like really robust systems, systems that are able to reason and articulate almost like better than a human in some ways. I would say at this point, the locomotion side is is as good or potentially maybe better than a human. I mean, you, you see some robots doing like front flips and back flips uh, in terms of how how well they can basically interact with the world. Uh, so we feel like that space just wasn't possible 10 years ago. The sensors and algorithms around to be able to control those robots and even the AI training systems around that have gotten so robust that we think this is like a soft space. We're making a lot of improvements in this area, but it's definitely um, it's, it's definitely sufficient to be able to introduce robots into real operations. So the first one is like lo- basically bipedal locomotion. 10 years ago, not really possible uh, to do in real commercial viability. The second is um, we need a certain amount of power and torques in the motors to be able to lift a certain amount of objects and manipulate them. And we need a certain amount of runtime in the system to be able to do like real, you know, hours and hours of daily operations. So the energy and power density in both the battery systems and the motors or the actuators were not energy or power dense 10 years ago to be able to do real operations from electromechanical perspective if we wanted to use batteries and motors. Uh, you look 10 years ago, you see some robots like Boston Dynamics were all hydraulic to basically get to like basically the you know the torques and powers they really needed to, to to basically move around the physical world. Today our system is all electric. We use t- like basically 2170 like basically energy uh, cylindrical cells that you would see in electric cars. And we have electric actuators that are basically electric motors with rotors and stators that allow us to basically build a really like I would say relatively simple and safe and high power and high energy system. And I do not think this was possible 10 years ago. The third is basically the we need to be able to reason through the world really quickly from a perception systems, manipulation policies, high level behaviors. We need to parallelize that work. Um, so from a compute and algorithm perspective, uh, I also don't think this was possible ten years ago to be able to do. So we're building onboard, you know, three D occupancy, twenty plus hertz. We are running our AI systems and inferring all, all that onboard with really powerful GPUs. Uh, we have like several thousand teraflops of uh, GPU capacity and the next generation robot that we're bringing up right now. Uh, so I think this is, um, again, not a really thing where we want to introduce autonomous systems into the world. It wasn't really possible. And I, I would say the last thing that here that's a, been a, a tremendous breakthrough for, um, for the robotic space has been the emergence of large language models. So we're going to be able to take a robot from the warehouse into your home through language. So there's just this need for like a semantic grounding of all the world's uh, knowledge that we're going to get through language, meaning I'll be able to, as a robot, interact with a human, be able to understand what you mean, and to be able to actually plan tasks based on what you're saying. And we're going to use all that through language. And we're spending a decent amount of time here now with our AI team, building different types of vision language models to be able to demonstrate those capabilities. And I think you know, what you said makes a lot of sense, right? Going from 
the factory to the home and not the other way around. I think a lot of people get very excited about a a home robot, but it does seem like there's low hanging fruits at much higher price points in the manufacturing and and factory world as opposed to uh, someone being willing to pay X thousands of dollars for the robot that can come in and do their dishes or put stuff in the laundry, take it out. I mean, it's really not as if we don't want to do the consumer side. We would love to ship consumer robots or help care for the elderly in these different aspects of the consumer market. Is it is this if you look at the like the the business like strategy we have, which means we want to get to revenue and we want to get to market as fast as we can. We need to get into markets that ideally are more constrained or less variable, like overall just more structured environments. That's the best. That'll be the easiest for us to do high performance operations. And it'll be quicker for us to build the data engine, the AI data engine that we basically need to build to basically train the robots and to generalize across new tasks. That means getting a robot that we can ship tens of millions into warehousing and manufacturing areas where there's like labor shortages that need our help, that can pay a lot. That's going to be, as a startup, that's going to happen a lot faster than trying to wait 10 more years with billions of dollars in more capital to be able to ship a consumer robot that needs to be really inexpensive, really robust, and needs to be able to generalize much easier across like very different homes and layouts and you know items it's going to grab and languages it needs to interact with humans. So for us, we think that this commercial side or more like industrial side will bootstrap what we think is the bigger business to consumer over time. And it will allow us to start getting data really early that we can start training our AI uh, systems with, which is, um, you know, as of now, the, the mo- one of the more important things we could be doing, which is like, how do we think about data collection? Um, how do we think about that at scale? And how do we think about running that through the AI data engine loop? Uh, successfully and recursively over time. And that's, um, we're spending like most of our time at this point trying to think about how we do that at scale and how we start doing that in early operations. And we're even spending a lot of time just bootstrapping that data with our certain clients we have. Yeah, maybe can you touch on what are some of the low hanging fruit tasks that you, you know, if you can do these, boom, there's already people that, that want to buy this. And I think people often think, right, humanoid robot has to do so much and forget that you know, there's hundreds of thousands of robots that literally just roll on the ground in warehouses now, or right, Amazon's rolling out pick and place robots. So there, there are some very simple things that need to be done. And so which ones are you trying to tackle first that you think will let you deploy into the field? I think it's maybe a few things to hit on first. I think the conventional wisdom that we um, feel from like the media and the world is that like, um, we're going to put robots in and they're going to replace humans doing this work. When we spend the time like going, getting boots on the ground with our customers and walking into like a really large warehouse or retail or manufacturing facility, it's literally the complete opposite. They are running out of humans to hire. They are turning, those humans are turned over a hundred percent per year. The jobs are sometimes a lot, very dangerous and really boring. They just can't find a way to automate the human mobility and dexterity that we, we see today with humans. And there's just like, there's just no plan. They don't know what to do. And when you look at a larger company that we say we potentially one of our clients, um, and you look top down to the factory floor, you'll see like these bays of really high automation where they'll have ASRS conveyor systems or like robotic arms and different things. And they'll be all over the place, all over the facilities and globally. And then between all that work, humans are bridging all that manually. They're moving bins and boxes or, you know, um, carts or whatever, whatever it is. And they have hundreds of thousands and in some cases, a million folks that are just doing this globally. And they just, the companies just don't know how to automate this work. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a labor crisis going on inside the organization of like, how do I stop refilling this role every like nine months? And it's really expensive. Um, so for us, when we walk into a, one of these larger companies, they're pretty well established. They're pretty standardized operations. And they've gotten to a point where they've standardized all their operations. So what we see is, I would say, a fairly large market of relatively simple things that we could start doing. Meaning like we could be moving bins and boxes, pushing carts. Say those bins, in a lot of cases at companies, there's only like five or six. They're all standardized. They're all the same size. It's the same exact bin we see everywhere globally. And then a lot of cases, they have payload constraints on all of their operations in those areas globally, meaning we might not see any more than 30 or 40, 35 pounds of payload in a bin at any point in time. 
So for us, that allows us to have basically a really structured environment that we can get into. We can also communicate from like a high level behaviors perspective with that operating system at the car manufacturer or warehouse, meaning, you know, the warehouse is generally a warehouse management system. Manufacturing facility generally has an MES or manufacturing execution system. That's literally beaming API and like calls to the robots or people and like what to do throughout the day to keep basically the business moving. So we think at this point we'll be able to ship tens of millions of robots, even in the US, in a very narrow part of the world and like warehousing and manufacturing, I guess, that are just moving bins and boxes and helping basically keep the operations going. It's it's much larger than what I thought a year and a half ago in starting the company. I thought we'd have to do these much more dexterous, much more complicated, like higher skew count item work, but it's really not the case. There's a lot of jobs that we can really help with that the companies really need uh, and help with automation that they just can't find help with today. So yeah, our initial applications will be in areas of manufacturing, retail, warehousing, and doing these basically end-to-end jobs, you know, 20 plus hours a day, seven days a week, and helping these companies basically automate a lot of this work. That's amazing. And so interesting to hear that the opportunity is actually bigger than what you imagined when you were starting. So then maybe on that same note there, are there other aspects that have surprised you since starting? Obviously, you go to start a company, lots of stuff on paper that changes when, when you go to start doing something. So maybe on the technical side as well, what's what surprised you from just a year and a half ago to where you are now? Yeah, I think the, so that was like a good thing I told you before, like, you know, it's like, it's, it's even better. We can ship more robots faster. The demand feels almost unbounded. <laughs> like, let's talk about the harder things now on our side of, thing, of the fence. I would say that axiomatically the biggest problem we've really faced here last year and a half is there's really not, like, when we build a humanoid, we need a certain amount of like, uh, like, I would say, uh, functional things that need to be built in order to make it work. We have a lot of different type of software, like whether it's the operating system, the AI systems, the control algorithms that are written in C++, uh, the firmware. We have a lot of areas of mechanical design, joints and kinematics and rotor to stator design to motor motor design. Uh, We have a lot of sensors on the robot. There's over 200 PCBs on our next generation robot at this point. Uh, So there's just like a, and we have compute and GPU and battery systems. So you have like a lot of stuff. The biggest issue we faced last year and a half is there's just nowhere, there's, there's, there's no good places to get really great supply chain across these areas. It's been, um, I've probably been off by like an order of magnitude in my expectation. <laughs> like we'd be able to buy like, like electric motors and actuators and sensors and battery packs and maybe, yeah, other types of electronics. Like it's, it's just been not the case. If we wanted to keep mass down, keep performance up, make it really reliable, make it safe, make it high performance. We've had to design almost all of the robot. (laughs) Like we've designed all the actuators, all the battery systems, uh, all the electronics, all the structures, like it's just everything we've designed. And even down to some of the sensors inside the actuator itself that are generally stuff that we thought we would never do even like six to nine months ago, we're we're now designing. And it's basically been, we've been basically forced to, as like a system engineer, you don't want to go out and build your own stuff. You don't want to build your own stuff unless you really have to. It's a, it's an enormous lift. It's just a huge burden for the company from a capital and focus and overall execution. You have to maintain it. Like there's just, just a lot of reasons why you'd never want to go build your own stuff if there's something good off the shelf. So yeah, we've basically been forced to build the whole robot from scratch. There's a lot of good news that will really emerge out of this where we can keep costs down. We can really control it. It's going to build a really great robot. It's really reliable, but it's certainly been... It, to be honest, it's been extremely painful for us the last year and a half. And we've had this saying now we've had on the wall for the last 18 months. It's like the only way out is through. That's right. If you're going through hell, keep going. Yeah. It was just like, we just got to, there's no way out. We, we see it. It's not going to, it's not going to change in a week or two. It's going to be months. Like we just got to barrel through it. And then on the software stack, right? You're talking about all of these different elements. And I think it's interesting to kind of draw a comparison to autonomous driving here. In that, you know, early on, and still some companies today, very hard coded, right? It's if you see a stop sign, here are all of the things you can do. You can go forward, you see this, you can go right, all of that. And now, as there's more data available, people are moving towards more of an end to end approach where it's just pure video in. And it's like you have enough examples. So there's less hard coding and 
the algorithm just knows what to do. With robotics, I feel like that's pretty different because there's just not that whole host of data out there. And so kind of how are you thinking about the computer vision element versus kind of hard coding rules into these robots and how do those two interplay? The big challenge here is that there's just no internet scale data for robotics, as you mentioned. There's no like, um, you know, similar to like, well, LLMC today, where there's just a tremendous amount of words that can be pulled out and scraped and tokenized and used as next word prediction doesn't exist in robotics. The data is out there, like, but we don't have access to it. There's no YouTube for robotics in that sense. The short answer is we have an AI first strategy here at the company. We, in the limit, we feel like figure is an AI business. That's why we called it figure AI. We will need to do this extremely well from basically pixels in over time to commands out to be able to do really high reliability work. The, the robot's going to only we really be useful in the limit unless we really figure this out. We do have to have like really great hardware because this is all for nothing without that dependency on the roadmap checked off. The hardware is just going to be incredible. And that's really where a lot of startups fall short in robotics is they just have really bad hardware to start or they've tried to buy off the shelf. or whatever. We just went head, head, head on and said, let's go build the best hardware possible. So we have a huge hardware team here. We spend a lot of time moving really fast, making a lot of reps. I think we're on a path now where we see over the next 12 to 24 months, us probably delivering really incredible hardware. I mean, the hardware is working really great now, but it's certainly not a place where we, we can put into a client site. It's working seven days a week for the whole year and not going down. And we're, we're, no, we're, we're not there, but there's a path to get there, I feel like, overall. So on the AI side, we strongly believe that we early on need to be collecting the right vision data, basically, and sensor data on site. We, we need to be like basically labeling that data and cleaning it. And we need to be training on that data and deploying that those models back into the robots into real commercial opportunities. We've already demonstrated now us training different like object sets and um, procession systems on our robot that are deployed on the robot now that are actually working on the robot fully end to end as we do autonomous math tasks. So I feel like the technology for this has really matured. Like um, it's not even really so much the algorithms have changed, but the, the the ways we go about training the models and deploying those has really gotten really robust. I think we've gotten um, really good at it here over the last like year. Um, so our model is how can we replicate that data that we need in operations as fast as possible before the fleet of robot is in there. <laughs> so we are actively on site collecting that data right now. We have people at our clients collecting that data, similar to how the robot would, that we're using as training sets that will train the robot ahead of when the fleet's there on like how to do these applications and understand what's going on. When the robots are actually in market, there's a fleet of them operating, they will be collecting data and we will be doing training on that data, similar to what's happened in the AV space going forward. But the real trick of this is like, how do you bootstrap that? Uh, so we're doing that. It's a, it's a little bit of a mix of sim and synthetic. And then there's also a mix of us basically getting real world data and using that as training sets. That's right. Some, some GoPros on factory workers. We have full people fully equipped out like our robots in factory floors, moving around, collecting data as of right, as like we, we, we've done that and we will continue doing that. Uh, I think that's the, for us, the equivalent of like somebody sitting behind the Waymo seat last like four years, just driving around, collecting that data that we need to label and train the neural nets. Uh, that's, our, that's the equivalent here for, for us, for humanoids. We need that data. It's going to be extremely important without that data with with any kind of variability that we might see, it's going to be relatively impossible to hard code these answers into the robot to be able to do. Uh, so to be frank, we do have C++ code in our systems. We do have control algorithms and stuff. But over time, I think that will be abstracted away. Uh, over time, this will be basically a fully neural net run system. And we're trying our best to get there as fast as possible. But it's, it's hard because we don't have a fleet of robots in the market. So that fleet of robots basically becomes the competitive advantage for the business. Like if you have a massive fleet of robots collecting data that are generalizing all that data to new applications, it'll be hard to like relatively compete with anybody. Like you have a fleet of millions or thousands of robots in market collecting data, training all that sets. The robots will get beamed new, um, new tasks, like be able to learn new things. Like as we train, as we do offline training. So it'll be as if like the matrix, you'll like, we'll look at the robots month to month or quarter to quarter, and they will know more. And they did before the quarter before that. They will collectively all know that and all share in that knowledge, similar to AVs. 
So over time, our robots will be able to walk into your facilities and do more things at the facilities. So they, every day we're getting smarter. And as we're deploying more robots, they will get cheaper. There's a linear relationship to manufacturing volumes and costs called the experience curve. And so we have one product that's getting cheaper and that's learning every single day. And we really haven't seen that general interface that's been able to do that outside of cars and phones in you know, our lifetime in the hardware slide. So that, that gets us excited, meaning like this is a, we're shipping what we think is like almost like FSD ready hardware today. Like our second generation robot that we're have out earlier in the year is capable of, we think, doing almost anything a human can or close to, I guess. Um, I think there's maybe some, some work left to do on the hands as we think about more dexterous manipulation. But for the most of the CPU, GPU in terms of range of motions and payloads and speeds, like we think we're pretty close. You know, we're 70, 80% of the way there in terms of what humans can do. So how do we solve the software game? We basically need to do large scale data collection. Got it. And then, yeah, I guess we can transition over to the business side of it you were mentioning, right? The experience curve we talk about in ARC's modeling a lot, Wright's law, which is that, you know, for every cumulative of doubling, you get a fixed percent cost decline. In some of the work we've done for industrial robots, it's actually a crazy experience curve. It's it's close to 50%. But it's interesting because, you know, industrial robots actually are not that high volume. So it takes a while to get to that cumulative doubling in production. And we're about to set off on a hopefully much higher volume robotics curve here. And when thinking about the robot itself, you know, the bill of materials, obviously small scale, much higher. You're building stuff in-house. Uh, I'm sure it's it's very high. But when we look out, say, five to 10 years, you have motors, the batteries probably aren't a huge factor in cost like they are for a car. So does it make sense to think of these as potentially, you know, ten to twenty thousand dollar items, or you think they're still going to be far more expensive than that? Yeah, so we've done a we've done a full bomb exercise here and we can talk about what that looks like over time. Um, it's extremely dependent on manufacturing volumes. So the question you want to ask is like at what volumes is is the price? It's um we're, we're building like one-off prototypes now. They're extremely expensive. We're CNCing the entire structure and, and motor housings. Like we will not do this in the real production. Like no, nobody, nobody does. We're building the show car and it's very different than what we'll do in production. The importance of though there is the show car needs to be able to demonstrate a human-like performance or it doesn't matter if the robot's $20,000. If it can't, if it can't do real work, then it's useless it's no matter what the <laughs> yeah, cost yeah. is. Yeah, exactly. So. I think there's a few things here. One is like, if you look at it, just like uh, back of the envelope, we have about a thousand parts in the robot uh, globally. So uh, the robot also weighs about 150 pounds or so, about a little over 60 kilos. So if you look at that comparatively, maybe like a Tesla Model 3, a Model 3 will have over 10,000 parts. So we have 10x less parts and it, we, we have about 20x less mass. So it weighs 20 times more in a car and it's 10 times more in parts. We feel that this should over time be just cheaper than a Model 3 car, uh, cheaper than the car. Now that's really dependent on like what manufacturing volumes uh, we, we really hit. And um, But if you look at like the full bomb cost, there's really nothing in the bomb cost that you look at. You're like, that's really going to be expensive at scale. Like the only thing that we think that, that might not get a lot of economies of scale, at least in the near term, is probably the CPUs and GPUs. I don't know if we're going to get like a 50% reduction in CPU and GPUs. Uh, Maybe ever, you know what I mean? Like, I just like, it, it depends. Like, it's really tough, uh, tough to, um, yeah, to do that. So we think uh, a decent amount of manufacturing volumes caught like half a million units a year run rate, that we can get the cost down to below $50,000. Yeah, we're pretty confident of that work. I think over time with enough work, this is a sub $30,000 robot. And I think that robot lasts like many years. So you're looking at really depreciating that cost over like multi many years. Um, and then you have some direct operating costs related to the maintenance of that and you have to charge it, maybe some insurance. So there is there is some additional costs that we'll, you'll incur uh, with having a robot in operations. You'll need to charge like you do your phone. We'll need to maintain it as, as, in some some areas. Like at some, some point, the batteries will, will be at end of life um, and they'll see cell life degradation just like your phone or, or say a car would over time. But yeah, I, I really think this is going to be relatively cheap. And it's going to keep getting cheaper. Over time, robots will help build other robots. And in the limit, the, the cost will just keep coming down. Most of costs in the world are distillation of like human labor. It's, it's, it's really like uh, if you can get the human labor down 
there's no reason that you can't get the cost of goods and services to start collapsing near zero over time. Right. And that's, you know, that's something we talk about too, is like the history of automation is removing output from human input, right? It's like without the tractor, you know, far more people would be working as farmers, right? You need, you need abstraction away from direct input to output. Uh, and robots certainly give a lot of leverage there, which then I guess brings up the next part of the question, which is, you know, what is the optimal business model where you have this fairly low cost robot that's providing a huge amount of value? And, you know, when we, when we're looking at modeling this, you can say, you know, here's all of manufacturing GDP robots lead to this percent increase in GDP. And it's like, what take rate of that can you charge as a service fee? Or do you think of it more so, you know, you're just going to hire this robot. It'll be less expensive than a person. And we'll take that on a recurring annual basis. It gets pretty crazy to start thinking about reducing the cost of the robot and robots out in the market, basically doing goods and service work are uh, helping with that problem. Meaning um, for robots out there, just as a, as a farmer and you're basically powering this with like, you know, solar things there. And we're, you know, we're using materials that are readily available around the farm. Like how the basic cost of all those items collapses to zero over time, especially if a robot's building other robots to do this. Certainly seems that over, t- over, t- over time, this could have a, a really fundamental impact on GDP. I mean, GDP is really measured like, you know, per capita per person, like, and if you have unlimited people and they're affordable, like are really cheap or getting cheaper, like what does that really do to overall GDP output? So I would say, you know, our view is that one of the healthier business models, I mean, there's basically two ways to look at this. We can either sell the robot, like a traditional uh, CapEx model, like the way you would buy a car or something like that. And you, you would buy it, you would own it, you'd depreciate it on your balance sheet. That's one model we could do. Uh, the second model is basically a leasing model. And the robotics area, they call it like robots as service, like RAS, like similar to SAS, which is kind of funny. And that, w- that would basically be you leasing the robot. And we feel that the latter, like leasing the robot, is one of the like better business models for figure and for the world longer term. We think it's a way to reduce the upfront burden to how much it costs. We, it's an ability for us to push more hardware and software into the systems, meaning we can constantly be refurbishing your hardware. We can be pushing new software into it basically weekly or daily um, and making the robot better. And if you look at the way the world is structured today, at least on the commercial side, like humans are RAS. You pay humans annually, you lease them. So the businesses are all set up to basically like lease this kind of labor. So yeah, we think it's a way to, for the, at least for the consumer side, to get the cost down to ultimately hundreds of dollars a month per person to own a humanoid to be able to do this work. But, you know, I don't think there's going to be, it really doesn't matter. Like for, for us, it's like, how do we get the cost down of this to help benefit the world? And our, our mission here is to really help expand human capabilities. Like how do we really do that? And the only way we're going to do that is get a lot of robots out. And the only way we're going to do that is if it's really affordable and really makes sense. And the only way we're going to do that is like if it actually does useful work. So I think, you know, we're a little less worried about nickel and diming like every client or whatever else we just really want to ship billions of robots into the world and make a huge impact and really help people like that's that's really why people are here working so hard and why i wanted to start the company so over time we just want to build a really affordable system so that'll just take time it, it really dependent on that is like it needs to do a lot of useful work across many different types of applications and then we need to get the cost down so it's actually affordable so you know those will really go hand in hand we really can't have it be too unaffordable or can't have it be too unuseful. It's got to be really useful and really affordable. So we're working through a lot of design for manufacturing and cost reduction across the system. And we're spending a lot of time just figuring out how to make the platform generalizable to almost any application we would see in the world. There's a huge opportunity. We already touched on it for low hanging fruit into factories, um, then maybe into the homes at higher price point individuals are willing to do this when when do you think the robot is indistinguishable from human capability that's a really hard question like humans are really capable (laughs) we have a lot of degrees of freedom really flexible we're we're squishy in some way like um that's a really hard answer um 
you know, I would say my view is based on different applications over time. It's kind of how we're looking at it, meaning we'll see a lot more capable robots be able to do like types of warehousing and manufacturing jobs just as good or maybe better than a human, like over the coming, like like this decade, like that we live in now. Uh, I think you will then, once that's getting to a certain um, maturity, you will start seeing robots into the home. Uh, they will be more expensive at first, just like every like you know adoption curve. And um, over time, they'll get cheaper and they'll do more and more things. But we'll start seeing that kind of like end of decade. We'll start seeing robots um, into the actual home doing real actual useful work. Uh, we will, over the coming years, be able to demonstrate like real kind of high-level behavior interaction with humans to be able to like talk to you understand what you do, build new applications based on what you say. So whether it's like, you know, go pick up this tea on the table that's spilling and go clean it all up, like we'll be able to actually start demonstrating those applications. But that's really like, um, it really needs to become like really robust and really affordable and uh, be able to kind of put in any scenario and understand and infer what's going on. Uh, and then the home is a little bit less tolerant of failures and then the w- warehouse. So like if I, if I walked in and dropped the number one dad cup, in your house like like that's no good right like uh if i drop a you know a bin or something like that at a, at a warehouse it's a very very different type of uh yeah uh very different so yeah we hope over the next 24 months we're introducing our robots into commercial opportunities on the, on the floors of a real customer and doing real useful work uh, we hope to be able to demonstrate fully end to end useful work uh within the next three to six months in our lab here fully autonomously and then uh, over the coming years, like single digit years, you'll see them in real big company, like Fortune 100 companies doing real work every single day, tw- seven days a week. And then as we approach the end of the decade, you'll start seeing these pilots at homes helping think about maybe caring for the elderly or doing housework chores. And then from there, it'll be a race on how do we do data collection at scale and how do we manufacture at scale? Uh, those are the really two like inputs we'll have kind of close, closer later in the decade, meaning um, and we produce close to what you probably know is better, but 100 million cars or so a year in the world. Like... There's certainly going to be a need, a need for like automotive grade manufacturing scale here. So the question would be like, how do you get there um, without like a hundred years of learning, like a hundred years, right? We've had with cars or more than that. Um, how do we get there with humanoid robots as fast as possible? Amazing. And I know you're probably heads down trying to get figure to work as, as well as possible. But what do you think of uh, some of the other companies out there? I know one that's made a lot of noise is, I think it's Fourier in China, saying that they're going to be mass producing their GR1. Obviously, in the US, you've got you know Tesla, Agility, I think. You've got Boston Dynamics, but I feel like they're less AI first. Maybe that's incorrect. That's That's my understanding understanding currently so do you have any analysis of kind of is everyone realizing this opportunity going about it a similar way or do you think there's unique paths that people are developing on yeah i think one of the big reasons i started this company is when i when i looked at the space and the players that are here uh, certainly if there was a player doing really well there would be like less willingness for me to actually start figuring and actually go off and do it like i really want the space to work if it happens to be me great it happens to be somebody else great but it's going to be best for humanity in my mind that a company does this and makes it work there's a lot of research groups in the space that are not commercializing and boston dynamics atlas is one of them they have you know that it's a research group it's on the website they're very public about it there you can't go buy the robots it's not, they're not trying to do like useful commercial work. They're trying to do upper level human agility. They're just not even a real player that you could go and buy robots today. I hope that changes over time, but certainly the case it is now. And we look at the less of the landscape. We really view um, being commercial, being able to show like dynamic walking capabilities is really important. Be able to show like you can manipulate and move objects and touch objects that are human like without altering the environment is really important. Meaning um, we think there's, no use in a robot, a humanoid robot that can't manipulate objects. It's useless. So a robot walks around really well, doesn't interact with the world. Like we think it's, there's very low value in that. And then I would say who's investing in the right AI systems to do end to end learning. And I think outside of that, who's got a great team and capital and rest of stuff. We looked at the space, you know, a couple of years ago, sorry, I just, we just felt like there was really nobody there doing that really well doing that best in class and we're striving hard to get to market there are some couple other groups that are doing really well i think tesla optimus is making great progress i think they have a great team i think they'll have a really good shot at making this work um from what i know from the outside and then beyond that we really don't pay too close attention to the rest of the groups we feel like what the dependency is for the horde industry is that 
somebody needs to show the world that there's useful human-like work that clients would pay for that are happening in the world. And we haven't seen, we've seen zero of that. We don't think there's a single application we've ever seen where that exact application existed on the floor that a client would pay for it. It's either too slow or they modified the environment to fake it or whatever else, or it's a prototype set up. So that's a huge burden on us and anybody else that wants to go out and try to make this work. That means for us, we don't view there's any competitors. We don't feel like we're even the group that's like out there demonstrating that yet. Like, so the start line starts with like, who's the group or who, who can demonstrate human level performance work that a client would pay for. And we hope to be able to do that uh, as soon as the next 90 days, which we're very close to doing right now in our lab. So you would probably be able to walk in today and see us doing pretty close work to what we actually a client would pay for. The exact cost of operations, scenarios, speeds, like we're just doing the right work we think that are like that we're seeing that our clients really want. And I think that's what we feel a burden on here is can we demonstrate really useful human-like work? And the space is yet to see that. I I feel pretty optimistic that you're going to see that in 2024 for sure. And I think you're, you're going to see it from us and hopefully some other groups really demonstrate that ability because the space really needs this. But I think you can expect next year that you'll see Figure doing fully end-to-end human-like work that clients will be paying for. That's amazing. And are you hiring? And how should people follow along on this journey, right? How, like, you know, what we're going to send this out there you know, who who are you looking for? Who should reach out? And then for all of the uh, robot fanatics out there, how do they follow along? So I think first, just follow along. Um, we at Figure are posting a lot. So I'm personally posting a lot about the business. Figure is also posting all the major updates what we're doing. We're going to try to be very open. I call the process like building in public. So we're going to try to do that. I'm trying to do that personally in my social trying to do that with figure. We're trying to be like very transparent. We're just like giving updates all on the way. You'll see us every within every 60 or 30 days providing very significant updates to the world, whether it's videos, just overall updates of what's what's really happened and milestones. So, you know, we're on Twitter, we're on LinkedIn, just like we're on YouTube. So we're going to try to basically have a public first approach to all of our announcements uh, going forward. As it relates to hiring, we treat the hiring process like super important. One of our company core values is building a championship team. Like how do we build the best team ever assembled to go do this? We I talk a lot about how we're like not a family, but we're like a championship team. And we're all coming together and we want to make this great team. Like not great, you know, maybe not the, like, the best individual person here and there, but like just the best team possible we can put together. And we're looking for folks with exceptional abilities. So we, yeah, so we're hiring at figure.ai if you go to the career section. And most of the hires that we have now um, are across our AI systems teams uh, and various software teams. So we have, I would say, uh, a lot of hires we need to make. We need to probably triple the size of our AI team over the next like six to 12 months, which we're actively doing right now. The team's completely incredible. Folks from Google DeepMind that have worked on robotics, uh, crews that have worked on procession systems, um, just like I would say the, the best in class folks that understand autonomous systems and basically AI training. So, uh, yep, I, our process is uh, pretty difficult to get through because we're looking for like pretty spectacular folks. Um, but, you know, recruiting is like one of our core focuses for the organization over the next 12 months is how do we continue to bring in the best and brightest folks into the organization? Amazing. Brett, thank you so much for taking the time from building the future of robots to uh, sharing all this information with us and the world. Can't wait to see what Figure has to offer. And remember, if you see Figure on a dating app, it's five six. So if it's saying it's six feet tall, you, you know they've become sentient. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. It's definitely lying. Um, well, Sam, good to see you again, and thanks for having me on. Arc believes that the information presented is accurate and was obtained from sources that Arc believes to be reliable. However, Arc does not guarantee the accuracy or completeness of any information, and such information may be subject to change without notice from Arc. Historical results are not indications of future results. Certain of the statements contained in this podcast may be statements of future expectations and other forward-looking statements that are based on ARC's current views and assumptions and involve known and unknown risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results, performance, or events to differ materially from those expressed or implied in such statements.